All right, everyone. Welcome to our weekly current events and election 2020 update. I'm Akash. And I'm Fatma. And we're presenting on behalf of the AP Gov and AP Lang team. Um, be sure to follow Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And right before we get started, just answer our um, little poll, our, our little poll um, about whether you're taking AP Gov or AP Lang, uh, just out of curiosity, so that we can kind of gather feedback and more about and just do better for our future streams. Um, a little bit more about our AP Gov and AP Lang teams. Every Monday at 8.30 p.m., we have our weekly current event stream. Um, Fatima, Brandon, or myself will always be hosting those. And the December schedule is in the works and it'll be released soon. So keep an eye on that, um, especially in your file portal so that you can um, keep up to date, both with AP Gov, AP Lang, and any other AP classes that you might be taking. Fiveable is a great resource for you guys to use, and let's get started. So in this stream, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the impeachment inquiry, um, political ads, and a little AP Gov tie-in. Um, and then we'll end with another current event with the Ivy League climate protests over this past week. And then we'll transition into election 2020 updates with Fatima, and then talk a little bit about, at the end about the Federal Election Commission. All right. So um, just a little thing that's been happening over the past few weeks. Um, EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland testified and has basically outed Trump. So um, he's outed Trump and other administration figures, especially um, at the top of the hierarchy, as players in an effort to extract a political favor from Ukraine in return for military aid. So this, this is kind of the main premise and issue behind the entire impeachment inquiry. Um, the impeachment inquiry is based on the fact or the question of whether President Trump pressured Ukraine to investigate um, a rival for pol political ga political gain. So that is technically, I guess, not allowed. And that is why the impeachment inquiry is being conducted. Um, Sondland's testimony, testimony puts her at rest two of the Republican key defenses. So what their argument is kind of based on is that the investigation was not based on first-hand info and that there was no quid pro quo, so that there was no premise to the investigation and that the investigation was not based on first-hand information. Um, Sondland's testimony kind of disproves all of this, so um, that's definitely something that is significant that's happened over the past week. Um, basically, what's really important about this is that Trump's defenses are slowly wearing down. Um, the Republican Party is trying to kind of shield Trump from um, those impeachment charges, but his defenses are going down because of um, these key witnesses that are going against him. Um, there probably will need to be um, more people on his side or people taking his side in order for, um, I guess, the politicians in Congress to change their mind. What we'll kind of see um, in the future slides is that, that Americans as a population are kind of already decided on whether they want Trump to be impeached or not. So there's not really much that we can, um, or that politicians can do to change that. So no matter who they bring in, um, because our country is um, so polarized, it's likely that those opinions aren't going to change no matter what those politicians do. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind, especially when you're reading um, about the impeachment inquiry on the internet, is that especially in reference to the population and when we're talking about polls that are taken, um, to uh, judge whether the American population is in support of impeachment or not, um, what you see might not always be the full picture. So always make sure to um, look at more than like one source when you're looking at that kind of stuff because um, there's definitely some biases in you know, um, these polls and that's something you wanna be aware of. All right, so what's left? So we kind of talked about how Trump's defenses are wearing down. Now the issue is basically, if is that enough for impeachment? And is that enough for removal from office? So um, stuff that, that kind of supports impeachment is bribery or high crimes and misdemeanors that are committed by the president. Um, it's up to the Democrats, really, if they want to, to try and prove that whatever Trump did with pressuring Ukraine would either fall into bribery or fall into the high crimes and misdemeanors category. Um, that's now up to Congress. So it's not really anything that witnesses can do themselves. Um, witnesses can help in that case, especially if they are strictly um, presenting the facts that favor one side. However, it's really up to Congress, up to those officials in order to decide what will happen now. Um, however, facts are 
we're still emerging. So there's always new stuff happening. Um, and there's always every day we see on Twitter, on Facebook, on social media platforms, more and more evidence of impeachment and more and more um, evidence of no impeachment or no um, crime being committed. So it's again up to them to decide and separate the truth from the lies and the truth, um, the real news from the quote unquote fake news. And that's why it's really impossible to come to a conclusion despite Sondland's testimony. And like I said before, Americans have already basically made up their minds. So um, most people that are um, liberally, liberally minded and most people that are conservatively minded, they have their own ways of thinking. So they already have their mind made up. So these facts that are emerging um, only make the situation even more confusing because it's impossible to come to a conclusion at this point. There needs to be some more solid evidence that needs to come out, especially from um, future hearings or something like that, that will help tilt the balance toward whether impeachment is justified or not in this situation. Um, kind of uh, staying with this topic, but also um, relating this to the future slides with election 2020 is political ad policies with several um, major tech giants. So Google recently announced restrictions on political advertising. And like I mentioned, the context to this is the 2020 election. With the 2016 election, we saw a lot of um, news that was untrue and it was circulated, especially on social media. And it did cause um, a lot of widespread misinformation. Um, if you haven't heard of something called Pizzagate, like uh, there was a whole like s scandal where um, a guy from North Carolina, he like drove up to DC, I believe, and he like threatened to shoot people because he thought Hillary Clinton was running some kind of like illegal ring or something like that. So obviously these things aren't true, but they're just coming from social media and bots and all of these things. So all these tech giants in preparation for the 2020 election um, their main goal is to make sure that this fake news isn't really isn't spread and all the news that is spread um, does not contain any misinformation that could persuade the electorate one way or the other. So um, they made it clear that outright lies are not welcome. So this is kind of a statement that is straight from Google and it shows the extent to which they're saying like, you cannot lie on our platform. So if you put out an ad, it has to be the truth. So this is gonna read it. It's against our policies for any advertiser to make a false claim, whether it's a claim about the price of a chair or a claim that you can vote by text message, that election day is postponed or that a candidate has died. So if you just read that, like obviously, um, like if an ad came out and it said, so-and-so candidate has died. Like that's going to cause a lot of panic, especially if it's one of the front runners or if it's a person that a lot of people are voting for, especially regionally, um, that's going to cause a lot of panic. And um, if this happens, let's say on election day, while you might think, okay, I'm never gonna fall for that. There are some people that are susceptible enough where and gullible enough where they'll fall for that and they won't vote for the candidate they wanted to vote for because they think that candidate is supposedly dead. So again, this again kind of goes back to the um, philosophy, especially um, with AP Gov, that media is always trying to um, influence our decisions. So trying to stay independent of that media is um, really the best way possible. Unfortunately, that's not always possible, um, but definitely cross-checking your sources and stuff like that is really important. So now we talked about Google. Um, now we're going to move into Facebook. So after Google put out its policy, Twitter had also recently put out a policy. Facebook is kind of unsure about how to deal with this because previously they had taken like an opposing stance. So Mark Zuckerberg had kind of made it clear that um, face Facebook was not going to fact check ads from politicians. So they said that no matter what a politician put out, they are not going to go through or their algorithms are not going to go through and see if those things are actually true. Now, that obviously caused a lot of controversy, especially in light of Google and Twitter putting out these new um, things or new policies that say just the opposite of what Facebook is doing. So Facebook says their defense of this policy is that it's, um, they're doing it in the interest of free speech. And even if they contain lies, they're willing to not fact check these ads. Um, instead of fact checking, they're supposedly looking at different approaches to dealing with political ads. 
So um, from like insiders, they've been contacting ad buyers and however, the Facebook reps are kind of staying quiet. So we're kind of unsure about what Facebook is going to put out because just recently they've said that they weren't going to fact check ads, but with Twitter coming out with their policy and then now Google, which that's obviously one of the biggest tech giants. Now we're kind of unsure if Facebook will kind of slightly twist um, its message from earlier and um, maybe change some things. So I would definitely, uh, this is something that I definitely keep an eye on. Um, and it's something that could really influence these elections. Um, the impact that media has on elections and voting is profound. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about with our AP Gov tie-in. So these streams with the current events are kind of meant to tie into both AP Gov and AP language. So AP Gov more in terms of the content, in terms of politics, and AP Lang more in terms of argumentation and how can you use um, synthesize different sources in order to form an argument about um, a subject. So each week when we talk about the impeachment inquiry or when we talk about the new updates in the election um, with the 2020 election, how can you go through and synthesize those arguments so that, um, or synthesize those sources that you're getting this information from and synthesize that into an argument um, about the impeachment inquiry or about what your what the election 2020 is going to look like. So today our tie-in is kind of going to relate back to AP Gov. So just kind of you can you guys can answer in the chat if you'd like. Um, we'll wait for like a few seconds. But how much influence do you think the media can have on an election, and how do you think um, media can influence an election? So not just how much, but how and why can the media influence the election? And the second question question, how can the media try to pressure us into believing something? So if you guys just want to answer in the chat, we can just kind of have a discussion. Um, we'll wait like a few minutes and see what you guys come up with. Okay, so um, that's okay. But um, that's just something that I kind of wanted to throw out there because it's definitely something that relates back to the content. So um, yes, actually, uh, media influences the election a lot because they can cause people to see the story one way and then believe it like that, exactly. So that's definitely one way that the media can influence in uh, the election. Um, a lot of times the media can be either conservatively biased or liberally biased. Um, like just in common day-to-day -day life, we know that CNN um, generally tends to have a liberal bias um, favoring the Democratic side, whereas the uh, Fox News channel tends to have a conservative bias favoring the Republican side of the aisle. So just with those two sources, if you look at something on Fox, you could possibly see a very different story um, than looking on CNN about that same topic. So the media can definitely pressure us into believing something and then can have a major effect on the election. Um, the other thing, is there such a thing as unbiased media? Really, it's hard to find stuff like that. If you look up like Pew Research Studies, they've done a ton about how media and um, political bias relate to each other. Um, like they have graphs where they show like how far right these um, news networks are and how far left these news networks are. There's very few that come to like the common ground, like at zero where they're not too far right or too far left. Like I think just from what I remember, I think like NPR news was uh, closer to the like midpoint, uh, but I think NPR even was liberally biased. So all of these news networks tend to have some sort of bias through their reporting. And if you listen to that news or um, read that news enough, you'll probably be able to figure out what that bias is. And that'll really help you. So just, again, tying it back to AP Gov, um, the point that media has a lot of influence on the election is definitely going to be tested on your exam in some way, um, whether it be through a um, court case um, or just through how much of an impact it can have um, on people's opinions before an election, after an election, all of these are things that could be tested um, on the AP exam. So kind of moving a little bit away from pure politics, um, over, the week, um, over, over the past week, um, some Ivy League climate activists broke up a football game. So student activists from Yale and Harvard stormed the football game on Saturday and they put up a sign that said, 
nobody wins. Yale and Harvard are complicit in climate injustice. So they basically stopped the football game and um, went out. The student activists went out onto the field and they put out this sign. Um, I believe in it. Yeah. So 70 protesters took the field after the halftime show and they're trying to get Harvard and Yale to divest their investments um, in fossil fuels. So a lot of these colleges have pledged that, but Harvard and Yale have not. So that's that was one of the goals of these student protesters. Um, one thing that you kind of see is that with the Ivy League schools, the um, I guess they are a little bit more expressive. So you see a lot of these, especially at the football games more often. I think this has happened or this is happening for the second time. And I'm sure this will probably happen again. Um, fossil fuel divestment, which that's basically just trying to not support businesses or uh, corporations that engage or that use a lot of fossil fuels. Um, that started with smaller colleges like Swarthmore, um, I believe was the first in 2011, and it's now become a global movement. So a lot of these student activists are trying to um, get colleges like Yale and Harvard, which are obviously big league colleges. Um, they are um, very famous in the US. They carry a lot of weight just with their name. Um, they're trying to get those colleges to divest. So. Again, these all kind of relate back to politics in terms of protest, our First Amendment rights. So kind of just be thinking about those things, especially with AP Gov in the back of your head when you're looking at these current event um, things that we do, because that'll definitely help you on your AP exam, especially if you have to provide examples for your free response. Now we're gonna transition into the 2020 election with Fatima. Okay. Uh, hi, Colin. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about what's been happening in terms of the Democratic primary. And so we've obviously been talking a lot about who's been part of the debates and whether or not last week we talked about Michael Bloomberg was going to actually jump into the race. And so he decided that, yes, he would officially be jumping into the race. And the biggest story around this is currently he spent a lot of money trying to like get ads and airtime reserved for like actually being able to run his political ads right because at this point there's already more than like 10 democrats in the field so having like airtime in terms of advertisements and being able to run campaign ads is like a central part of his strategy because he hasn't been able to like capitalize on having just like been part of the democratic debates like before this and so one of the really very important things to remember about him is that he is the eighth richest American in the country and he has a net worth of like 54 billion dollars. So he has a lot of money in his pocket. And the reason why that's really important is because even though he's had like political experience, like being the former mayor of New York City, right now he doesn't have like a very big democratic base behind him to like give donations. So a lot of the like money that's being spent in terms of like ad buys is being done like through his personal wealth. And so on that note, he's bought around $34 million in ad re reservations so far. And so it's in about 46 states. And so he faced a lot of criticism, criticism when he did this, right? Because Democrats like Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and like even representatives like AOC have been talking a lot about getting money out of politics and making sure that people are in like grassroots movements are more of what is like funding people's candidacies. And that's also why a lot of the current people in the Democratic primary have pledged to not take corporate PAC money. And so the fact that like a billionaire comes in and spends millions of dollars on ad buys is something that has like been something that's the exact opposite of what these Democrats are advocating for. And so a lot of people are saying that he's like trying to buy the election because he's spending his own money to like buy ads he's going to run for his own campaign, right? So in order to like counter some of that criticism, he also like committed to spending a hundred million in ads that would just be aimed at like criticizing President Trump and another 15 to 20 million to register half a million voters. But like, even though he committed to doing this, there's still been a lot of backlash from like Democrats that are trying to like stop money from being poured into politics, especially when that money isn't coming from people, but from like companies, because they say that it's taking more representation for like normal people to actually 
get their voices heard than it is for like these companies that just have millions of dollars to spend and to get their voices and like interests heard within Congress. So yeah, he spent a lot of money trying to get any amount of recognition in this primary. And so on that note, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the Federal Election Commission. And so the FEC, which Akilish will uh, show when he flips to the next slide, is a very important agency when it comes to like federal elections, because it's pretty much the agency that of, of enforces like funding and campaign regulations. And so it makes sure that nothing like illegal or untoward is happening. And it makes sure that campaigns are being run within the bounds of the law. And so we usually don't do these kind of deep dives, but what's happening right now is a little bit in the weeds. So we decided to like take a closer look in terms of what's happening. So the FEC or the Federal Election Commission is an independent agency within the federal bureaucracy. And so the reason why we're talking about it today is because it can't currently enforce campaign finance laws. And so what that means is that it can't pass new rules, it can't pursue investigations or issue fines, or hold any formal public meetings. And so that's especially important because as Akhilesh mentioned earlier and talked about like the 2016 elections, um, and one of the reasons why like Democrats wanted to have impeachment hearings for so long was because there was a lot of like alleged Russian interference within the 2016 elections, right? So the Federal Election Commission was working on increasing transparency and making sure that like ads were being run in like a way that was more um, directly transparent to Americans. And so the important thing to remember is agency staff, like the people who work for the FEC can like, they can continue investigations that are already like ongoing and they can begin new ones. There just won't be any like votes in terms of the people who are like commissioners for the FEC. And so, on top of that, the campaign finance reports will still continue to be due and agency staff will still be reviewing them. And so what that means is like quarterly, you like find out how much like Democrats or like Republicans earned in terms of their fundraising. And so that's like pretty much reported to the FEC. And so the reason why all of this is happening and the reason why they can't pass any new rules or like hold formal public hearings is because they don't have something called a quorum. So a quorum is the minimum amount of people needed to do something. And so in terms of the FEC, that's a minimum of four commissioners for them to take any actions and they currently only have three. And so the reason why they don't have enough people right now is because Trump and the Senate can't really agree on who should fill even one of the three vacant spots. So even though President Trump like has a name that he like wants to be the nominee and eventually like be on the FEC, um, Senate Republicans haven't been agreeing with it. So it hasn't actually happened. So the FEC is currently like stuck doing like its investigations, but not being able to actually like pass new rules or continue to do like its job. So on that note, uh, on the next slide, we're going to talk about how like this has had an actual impact on the democratic process. And the way that it's happened is that the FEC in May already had a backlog of 269 cases. And so that's really important because a lot of these cases had already met the five year statute of limitations mark. And so after those five years are over, it means that the cases just expire and the like um, commissioners don't get to actually vote on what kind of punishment will be doled out for like any violation of campaign finance law. So it means that the people who like committed the violation kind of just get away with it. And so, making sure that there are a minimum of four commissioners on the FEC at all times is something that's really important in order to make sure that like people don't get away with like breaking the law. And so a former FEC chairwoman, um, Ann Ravel, explained that in her own words, that no enforcement of campaign finance disclosure laws could literally mean that illegal, undisclosed, or even foreign money could 
seep into the 2020 election. And so obviously, as we're talking about 2020 and making sure that there's like no interference from foreign actors, it's something that's really important to ensure that the democratic democratic process is both like fair and free, right? And so the Federal Election Commission, the FEC, is a very important part of that because it makes sure that like no illegal money actually like gets into campaigns. And so it's something that's especially worrying because of the 2016 elections. And so another person who was like uh, a chair of the FEC, um, Ellen Weintraub, talked about it in August, said, and she said that like the impact of this is already being seen by the FEC and that they recently closed an enforcement matter without actually investigating it, even though there were a lot of serious allegations of Russian money being funneled into elections because they couldn't get the four votes to actually investigate. And that's something that's really important because if the FEC can't even like actually start investigating whether or not there's foreign money going in, if there's like serious allegations, it becomes very problematic into ensuring that that money isn't actually being spent for a certain candidate. And so this isn't where the impact ends because it keeps going, right? Because the FEC obviously has a very important role to play. And so when we look towards what's happening on the Trump campaign on this next slide, uh, we can see exactly how it's had a very real impact on the elections right now. And uh, so there is the Trump campaign has obviously been like trying to capitalize on the fact that the FEC isn't being able to like actually enforce their laws. Um, and there's been reporting done by the Center for Public Integrity that explains that Trump's reelection campaign hasn't paid public safety bills in cities that's that have been hosting his campaign rallies. And so these public safety bills are pretty much like money that goes to like cities and municipalities that are like having their law enforcement come out and make sure that like no violence or like nothing like happens at their rallies to make sure that like everyone stays safe, right? So the Trump campaign has been arguing that they don't have to pay these bills, period. And so that's obviously like something that isn't really like hasn't been done in the past because like everyone sort of just accepts that these bills have to be paid, right? Because you're hosting a rally in a city and they're trying to make sure that no violence occurs at them. And so federal law says that even if like you're disputing whether or not these like bills actually have to be paid, they still have to be reported as something that's called disputed debt on campaign finance disclosures. And so the issue that has happened with the Trump campaign is that they haven't actually been disclosing these disputed de debts. And so agency staff can start investigating it, but the investigation can not actually be finished because there isn't a quorum, aka a minimum of commissioners that's needed to take a vote and actually like make a ruling and decide whether or not it's allowed. So that's what's been happening in terms of like the Trump campaign taking advantage of like the FEC not being able to do something um, about like behavior that isn't necessarily like legal and uh, in terms of campaign finance. So that's a little bit of a deep dive in terms of what's been happening in the FEC and the fact that the FEC hasn't been able to do much. Uh, in terms of like its commissioners because they're like missing one more person to make for the minimum people that they need. So thanks for joining us on tonight's stream. Uh, as Akhilesh said at the very beginning, AP government always streams on um, Mondays in terms of the current event stream. And so it'll always be me, Brendan, or Akhilesh. And we're going to be releasing the December schedule for both AP and AP Lang streams soon. And if you guys have any questions, make sure to drop them in the chat and me and Akhilesh will make sure to answer them to the best of our abilities. And if you guys are good, you guys are um, good to go. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.